right, back to Vera Coach of the Bearded Giant. The Encyclopedia of Ancient Deities says this, that the name Viracocha actually means sea foam. Notice that he's sitting there and he has serpents on his right and there are two-headed serpents, serpents facing in opposite directions. What does that imply? When you have opposites, you have things like black and white, night and day, iron and miry clay that don't cleave together. That's what the, that's the they mingling themselves with the seed of the men. That's who Viracocha is. But his name means sea foam, God of law, the supreme God, teacher of the world. He sculpted in stone all the races of men and his work can still be seen today. He is the God of water and growing things, the creator and spirit of life. Like Pachacamac, Viracocha attended the Incas in Peru and was taken by them as one of their gods. He lived in the depths of Lake Titicaca. He is the creator of the sun, moon, and the stars and was Lord of thunder, lightning, and rain. His father is the sun, boy, think about it, and his brothers are Pachacamac and Manco Capic. His sister and wife is Mamacocha, also a deity of the water. Children and animals were sacrificed to him. Stop! Remember what I said about when you people worship snakes, they do really bad things? They sacrifice their own children to this God. Now think about that. The God we serve doesn't ask us to kill our own children in order to make him happy. That's sick. That's wicked. Our God sacrificed himself for our benefit. Please God to bruise him. Mm. His servants or assistants are named the Tonopa or Terapaka. Somehow Viracocha, who is without flesh and bones, has a beard, wears the sun as his crown, and carries a thunderbolt. He also has a reputation of being a swift runner. Sometimes Viracocha wanders the earth as a beggar. Some say Viracocha's opponent was named Taguasipa. And you'll have to, I don't know how to pronounce some of these names. But there's a lot of, a lot of similarities here in some of the ancient myths about the gods. But think about this idea that Viracocha means sea foam because the story of Viracocha was that he came, like Freemasonry, he came from the east across the ocean and arose out of the foam of the sea. Now, if that phrase rings bells to you, then you obviously know something about Scripture. Because Hosea 10, as for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water. Samaria was wicked and her king, being wicked, was cut off as the foam upon the water. The foam, in other words, it sort of means it dissolves and then goes away. This is what Jude was referring to when he talked about the false teachers and the false prophets of the, of the last days. What did he say? Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Think about the gods that sinned against God. They committed the crime of folly and God sent them down into where? The darkness of the deep to be reserved unto the day of judgment. What did Paul curse the false prophet with that he encountered in Acts chapter 13? He cursed him with darkness and he walked around blind. Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw beast where? Rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns because Viracocha in some it says that he rose up out of Lake Titicaca. In others he rose up out of the foam of the sea. It's a picture of the religion of the Antichrist that is rapidly encroaching into as Christianity wanes in this world the religion of the Antichrist is going to increase. And we're already seeing it. It also mentioned that Viracocha carries a thunderbolt. What is that symbolic of? Not just in mythology, but in scripture. Now, number one, this links him to both Thor, if you've watched the Thor movies, or you know anything about 
you know, Nordic mythology, Thor wields a thunderbolt. So does Zeus. And Zeus is rendered in some places as being half man, half serpent, who fathers children from human mothers. Okay? But what does a thunderbolt represent in Scripture? Luke chapter 10, verse 17, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as the lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. There is a lot here in this passage. When Jesus sends the 70 out, I think it's, a, I think it's prophetic, Revelation 7, and like Revelation 14, multiples of 7, right? But he sends the 70 out in preparation of his kingdom. And when that happens, he, he basically gives them the power so that devils are subject unto them. And when they come back and they said, even the devils are subject to us. And Jesus says, yeah, I know. I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven because I sent you out and I gave you that power. <whistles> right? Okay. But then he says, I'm going to give you power over all the enemy upon serpents and who else? Scorpions. Revelation chapter 9. I saw a star fall from heaven. And unto him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And what came out of there? Locusts with scorpion tails for five months. Okay? I think there's a connection. Might I say, I think there's going to come a time when God is going to give His disciples power over serpents and scorpions. Both of them sting and kill. Think about that. What's the sting? The sting of death. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law, thus the ten toes. Okay. So I think God's going to give His people power over scorpions when they show up. They'll be under our feet. They will not be able to do to us what they do to everybody else. God won't let it. Amen? But He said, don't rejoice that you have power over the devil. Because you know, some people do. Oh, God's given me power to heal people and I can cast out devils and I, I'm a great... I'm so sick of these people. He said, don't rejoice that you can do that. Rejoice that your name is... I mean, think about how your name got written in heaven. It's because God's mercy. Rejoice that God forgave you of your sins for crying out loud. I mean, get your mind and your pride right. Amen? So think about the thunderbolt then, because it represents Satan falling as... I mean, what is Satan? He's a dragon. He's a serpent, a fiery flying serpent. And lightning is like serpentine. What does lightning then represent? Lightning is what connects heaven to earth. Bum, bum, bum. Got it? So then you have all this lightning symbolism, like Hitler, he knew what he was doing when he formed the Schutzstaffel the SS, and then had the letter S after the runic character that represents S, which was two lightning bolts. Think about it. Captain Marvel, and I still haven't figured out why there's two Captain Marvels. One from DC Comics, one from Marvel Comics. But anyway, Captain Marvel was Billy Batson who is transformed into a god. And Billy Batson then is counseled by a council of gods. 
I mean, I grew up in the 70s. I watched, you know, Shazam every Sat and ISIS every Saturday morning. Never missed an episode. And I look back at it now and I'm going, that is the corniest show I've ever seen in my life. But, you know, when you're seven, eight years old, that's, oh, look, he can fly. Look at that. He's cool. And he's talking to the gods. And he's transformed into a god. Kiss. Some say it represents kings or knights in Satan's service. Why does that not surprise me? Harry Potter, what's the mark on his forehead? Satan fallen as lightning, lightning, fiery flying serpent connecting heaven and earth. Now, since they talked about the Peruvian god Viracocha, and we've set up this idea of the sons of God and the daughters of men, the seed of the serpent, Dragons producing children. It's in every story, in every myth, in every culture around the world. We don't believe in myths. We believe in the biblical version only. But the myths are the fossilized, corrupted remains. Not, it, it's got elements of the truth, but not the whole truth. The only whole truth you're going to find is in the scriptures. So when we look out into the world and we see all these myths and stories, we're supposed to go back to the scriptures then to find the, tr number one, if it's even true, and to find the truth of it. So the question is, was there a time when the gods, evil angels, created hybrids on this earth? Absolutely. No doubt it happened before the flood. God and they they were kings. Okay, they were kings. They were gods on this earth, and God cleared the earth off. But then it happened again. Only not, I would say they weren't as you know, they didn't corrupt near as bad as it did before the days of Noah. But it happened nonetheless. And then you have stories, literally, of giants in England. You have them all in Europe. You have them in Russia. You have them in China. You have them in uh, Africa. And you have them in North and South America. All of these native stories of giants. Viracocha himself being essentially a reptilian-type god. Part man, part dragon. Now... I've been following this for the last few weeks. This came up uh, in my YouTube suggestion, and I watched a video, and I went, hmm. What I'm going to present to you, I present with a question mark, and the question mark has nothing to do with Scripture. The question mark has everything to do with, are these the true remains of what the Bible says actually happened. Because you know that there are stories of, you know, as people migrated from the East Coast through the Americas back in the 17 and 1800s, they would go and they would find giant skeletons. These giant skeletons were sent to the Smithsonian and then they just disappeared. So there were giants living here, there's no doubt often described as having double rows of teeth. Do you know what creature in the world has actually, actually has physically two rows of teeth? Look in a serpent's mouth. They have two rows of teeth. Not kidding you. Okay? So, there have been produced what's called the Nazca mummies. Mummified remains of what apparently is reptilian humanoid creatures that look both human and reptilian, like a serpent or a dragon. Nazca tomb, latest tests on alien mummies found in Peru say they are not human. There is a bunch of stories on this, okay? And I'm going to take you through some of the graphics, some of the pictures, some of the evidence. 
DNA shows that in the largest mummy, the absence of a Y chromosome, which would make it a female. And the DNA test actually shows that they have 23 pairs of chromosomes like humans, 46 in total, 23 pairs. But the DNA sequences itself does not match either human DNA or any other known creature. Let me give you an example. The difference between chimpanzee and human DNA. Chimpanzee has 97% human DNA. It's only a 3% difference, but look at the difference 3% makes between chimps and humans, right? It's a big difference. But chimps have 97% human DNA. Other species significantly less. These, according to the preliminary DNA tests that have come in, they only match like 25 to 30 percent human DNA. So they're like way removed from human DNA. Here is an image of one of the first mummies that was ever presented. Notice the three fingers. Now, is that faked? Here are some other mummified three-fingered hands that have been discovered. You can see an x-ray of those hands. And some have said, well, that's easy. You just take a human hand that's been, and you chop off this, and you chop off this, and then you have a three-fingered thing. But the problem is, see, we have a bone here, and a bone here, and a bone here, and a bone. So we have one, two, three, four. These hands have as much as five or six bones, all connected together in their three-fingered hands. Okay, I'm just saying that's what they have. And these x-rays and these hands have been examined by actual physicians, surgeons, people who are specialists and know human anatomy. One man says these hands have not been altered maybe an unknown species for sure. And you can look this up. The YouTube video is Three Fingered Peruvian Mummy Documentary that will make you question everything, and that's on YouTube. T dial that in, watch the video. Because the skin is clearly reptilian, and on some of these hands, there's like this gold thing built into it. They don't know what it is. But the skin that covers these bones is scaly reptilian type skin. And the three fingers, when I saw that, it made me think of that. The Jewish rabbinical Kabbalah blessing. Also, the Masonic grip of the lion's paw. I watched two Freemasons. They didn't know I was looking. I watched them, and I knew they were Freemasons. I knew it before they came, and, but I watched them grip one another at a funeral I went to. So I know that's their, and what do you have? One, two, three. Okay, is there a connection? I'll show you the connection as we move on, okay? Um, here in one particular video, the skin of these mummies is being described as serpent or reptilian, and there you can clearly see the skin. Now, the main material on this is being put out by a website called Gaia.com. Gaia, yeah, I know who that is. Okay, the goddess of the earth, mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. Okay, and some of these videos are free to watch. They have some that are behind a wall. You have to pay to get it. I have not paid them money and won't uh, just to watch their videos. Okay, but they're the ones who are promoting this and they have called in certain experts. Now, some people won't touch this with a 10-foot pole. And what you're going to see on the internet is you're going to see their websites, news articles and such, and scientists are saying, these are hoaxes. Why are they hoaxes? Aliens. That's why. Because they won't 
acknowledge the existence of either what the Bible says, sons of God, daughters of men, and giants. They won't, it, they won't touch that ever with a 10-foot pole. So anything that smacks of aliens or gods coming to the earth and mating with human women or whatever, they're instantly going to say it's got to be a hoax because aliens, and they don't believe it. And I've looked at some of the websites and some of the articles where they've said this is a hoax. It has to be a hoax. But then they don't offer any evidence. They have not examined the mummies and anybody, well, I wouldn't say anybody, but these are being offered for people to look at. And some have said, yeah, we'll look at it. And then all of a sudden they said, no, we're not going to look at that. We just, they're hoaxes. We're not going to waste our time. Now, again, I don't know that they're hoaxes. What I've seen so far leads me to believe that it's possible that they're not. What I can show you from scripture is I believe scripturally it's possible. So in saying that, some of the experts that they have had, quote unquote experts that they've had examining either the x-rays or the CT scans or the high definition tomography, I think, some of the scans that have been done, some of these scientists are legit. Like this one, the video calls her MK Jesse. She is a musculoskeletal radiologist, University of Colorado Hospital. I went to University of Colorado Hospital's website, and sure enough, Mary Jesse is the associate professor of radiology on staff. She's examined. Now, this is a woman who knows human anatomy, knows human skeletons. When she examines these x rays, she says, I see bones that are not human bones connected to, I can see them connected together. They don't look like it's been manipulated and there's a lot more bones there than what you would find in just, if, if they chopped off this hand or this finger and this finger and left this, there's still extra bone stuck out here and the bones are, they don't match human physiology is what she's saying. Here's some of the smaller mummies that they have found. Now they're all coded See if I can remember this word. Um, it's a type of little sea creature that when they die, they turn basically into little, like little calcified remains. And a, this, is, this is a substance it's used in, they use it in paint, they use it, it's a desiccant. It has the properties of drawing water out of things. And these mummies were coated in this dust that just sucked all of the moisture out of it. That's how they were so well preserved, okay? So that's what you see here. And you see that these mummies have been presented so that they can be x-rayed, that can be scanned, that can be CT scanned, that can be MRI'd or whatever scanned. In other words, they're not saying, no, we're not gonna let you look at these. They're just real. These have been examined, these have been x-rayed, and experts in Peru and Mexico and the United States have examined these. Here's some of the x-rays right here. Notice the skull. It's not anybody I've ever seen before. The legs, the fingers, the arms. In, in the larger mummies, it has a radius and an ulna, but in the smaller ones, just one bone here with three long multiple boned fingers. And in one of these, they noticed a protuberance around sort of the lower body and they're, okay, what is that? Well, under x-ray, they're eggs. And they're oblong eggs. The rib cage, the spinal column, the frame itself is that of a humanoid, but the rib cage is that of a serpent, and the eggs are that of a serpent's eggs. Under high definition topography, you can clearly see the bone structure, the three fingered hands of each, and everyone who is actually examined, not just said it's a hoax, but everyone who has actually examined them said that for the most part, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that 
these were just bones put together to, that were made to look like this. Here is another examination. When they examined the eggs, there are internal structures inside the eggs. Possible embryonic formation. It looks like they really are eggs and it looks like that there are embryos inside those eggs. That's just weird. Now, again, is this real? I can't say it yet. Now, the guy who found these says there's a lot more and he won't tell anybody what cave in Nazca. You remember Nazca is where the Nazca lines are. These lines that are drawn in the desert that you can only see them from an airplane. And you're on the ground, you'd never know they were there. Nobody knew where they were there until one guy, 1930s or something, got flew, flew in that air and he went, there's like animal shapes and some sort of big headed alien waving. Nobody knew they were there. That's the location where they found these mummies. And the guy says, yeah, he's a grave robber. That's what he does. But he said, I'm not telling you because there's more there that I haven't got to yet, but I know they're there and I'm not telling anybody where they are. Because then all of a sudden they're just going to disappear, right? Um, and so, you know, some of the mummies, you know, I can't say 100% that these are real, these are the real bodies of reptilian humanoid creatures from outer space. I can't say that. I don't know it for a fact, but I want you to think about this. If, if just one of these, let's say they've got, and they do have the, like four or five of these mummies so far. Let's say four of them are fake. One of them's not. Because apparently the, the skin that covers the mummies is one solid piece of skin, not something stitched together. If one of these are real, what's that going to do? What's that going to do to history? What if uh, some Harvard scientists say, okay, we'll bite, we'll look at it. And they look at it and say, this is not anything we've ever seen before, but it's not fake. We have the DNA evidence. We've examined the bones. We've, t we've taken them apart. We've looked at the eggs. There's reptilian humanoid embryos in the eggs. What if that's true? What, what's going to change in this world? Because, you know, it's been said for years that if actual proof of alien life was to ever be manifested on planet Earth, it's going to change every religion in the world, except for mine. And this is part of the shield of faith and the Satan's serpent's fiery darts that he has against people is that all these people's religion, they're going to find out that they're not God's soul people and there's not a God. We were put here by aliens or whatever. Whatever story they come up with is going to be part of, I think, this big lie that's going to be told that a strong delusion is going to occur and everybody's going to fall for it except those with a shield of faith. The fiery darts are coming. And if your worldview doesn't allow for there to be the crossbreeding of gods and men, then change your worldview, even your biblical worldview. Change it because the Bible says it. The Bible teaches it. Now, I'm going to apply the same verse that I used when I was asking God late one night, God, is it even possible? Because, you know, I've, I've had this theory for years, and I, I taught it in a video I did called UFOs, Chariots of the Beast, um, that these UFOs, they are devils. They're, they're spirit chariots. That's similar to what you see in Ezekiel chapter 1. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Well, 
all of these UFOs, they come in various forms and shapes and different colors and different sizes and different this. And people say that's why they're all fake. People are making it up and they can't keep their story straight. But we know that there are a multitude of different types of spirit creature that God has made. Think about all the beasts that are in the oceans. How many different forms of fish and some we haven't even figured out yet that look weird. Oh, that looks so weird, right? Well, think of the stars as the ocean that God has made all of these different looking creatures in. And we know from scripture that a third of these are gonna to fall to the earth. What are they gonna look like when they fall, when they get here? What form are they gonna take? And does God punish those angels who left their first estate to come and meddle down here on planet earth? Does God punish them? Absolutely. So let's take that verse that the Holy Ghost gave me the night I was asking God, God, if these are spirit beings that are these UFOs and these aliens coming, or these are devils, then how is it that they died? Because the whole point of being a God or a spirit is that you are immortal. Psalm 82. I, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, the sons of God, in other words. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. And that was the verse that the Holy Ghost gave me. Mike, they are gods, but I allowed them to die like men. Did a crashed alien ship, did, a, did an alien ship, a UFO, a flying chariot, spirit chariot fall and crash at Roswell with dead alien bodies? I think it's possible. I, biblically now. But out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So, then I go back to Isaiah 11, where it, or Isaiah 14, where it's talking about how they're fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Remember, because he said, you are gods, but you shall die like men and fall like princes. Princes are principalities, devils, gods. So, Lucifer falls from heaven. But what does it say before verse 12? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Worms are associated with death. The grave is death. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Then remember Ezekiel 28, where if it's a prince, a god, how can it be a man? I have said, ye are gods, and all of ye children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a god. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So three witnesses that are telling us that these gods fall, and because of that, God allows them to become mortal. Now they can die. And I think some of them already have. Crashed alien ship at Roswell. There are other stories around the world of this happening and now we apply that to the possibility that the fossilized mummified remains of dragon humanoid creatures were found at a place known to be a place where whoever dug those lines in the desert there at Nazca had to have seen it from thousands of feet up in the air, right? So here is Dr. Edson Salazar Vivanco. He's a medical doctor in Peru. He examined the bodies and did the x-ray, did the CT scan. And here's what he said. So far, we haven't found anything to say it is a fraud or that the bodies have been modified or altered in any way. And again, you're going to find a list of specialists, qualified specialists, who have actually looked at the mummified remains and said, 
we don't see very much to indicate at all that this is faked. We've, what we're seeing is a species that we have not seen before. And again, they're not saying they're aliens yet. They're just saying, they're being scientific, and they're saying we're examining the, the remains, the bones, the skin. There's actually organ tissue left in here, eggs. And we're seeing that we don't find evidence that this is a hoax. And again, the, I went to the other websites that said, it's, it's a hoax. And when they said, you know, the reasoning behind it's a hoax, you have one scientist who says, I don't believe in aliens, that has to be a hoax. But they've ne none of these people who are claiming it's a hoax have actually examined the bodies. None of them. And the invitation has been sent out, and people won't touch it. Okay? So what I'm saying to you is, if this is true, I can show you in Scripture that it can be true. And if this is true, Scripture has already been true for thousands of years. And if you don't have the shield called faith, where you believe what the Word of God says, this is going to throw you. Again, out of the five bodies, the four or five bodies that they have, if one of them, if one of them is not a hoax or a fake, what does that do to the worldview of people on this earth? Okay? DNA testing has been done. Genome testing by reputable labs was done on several specimens from these mummies. Guess what I found out? This is one of those... Bum, bum, bum. Guess what company did the genome testing on these? It's a company, I think, based in Peru. A genome testing company called Abraxas. Do you remember who Abraxas was? He was the serpent deity that had the tuft of feathers like a crown on his head. He was a basilisk, a cockatrice from whence the word abracadabra came from. Coincidence, you know, I just, I don't see a lot of coincidental things happening where that's not some sort of zeitgeist, spirit of this day, the spirit, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I think there's a spirit, a dragon involved. Let's move on and talk a little bit more about the Serpent of the Americas, how they were worshipped. Here is El Castillo. And I want you to notice El Castillo, which is, I think it's in Cancun, Mexico. And a lot of people go to visit this, but a lot of people go on the solstices, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Because on the summer solstice, June 21st, it has to be on this day and on this day only, like around noon or so. This, I mean, how were these pyramids even built? Because where did the technology come from, from people who basically were growing and grinding corn to survive? Where did the technology come from to align this pyramid and build it in such a way so that at exactly noon, on the exact day of the summer solstice then, that the corner of this pyramid, the sun shining on the corner of this pyramid at this exact time on this exact day would form basically lightning bolt serpentile type, a serpent descending down from the heavens to the earth. I mean, look at it. That's what El Castillo is. Now, on this pyramid, on all four sides, there are 91 steps exactly. That makes, it's a 91 times 4, 364. With the capital, the top, being 365. That's the number of days in the year. So what does this have to do? It has to do with they were observers of times. This was the serpent's religion, observing times. This is what Manasseh got into. It got him in so much trouble, right? Because he made this like 14 rows. Remember that that we did on Manasseh and his 13 things that he did, and the 14th one was he put an idol in the house of God, okay? So the pyramid basically being a whole thing about the observation of times. And what is it based on? It's based upon the idea, think about this, 
The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech, not into night. Showeth language. There is no speech nor voice where their language, or no speech or language where their voice is not heard. And Paul used that verse to say that's how the gospel goes out to people. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The story of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. The gospel going out to the world. So the heavens then are declaring, he says, day unto day, to night unto night, showeth knowledge. So we have the sun rising and setting and then rising again from the east to the west, coming back up into the east. And think about Jesus. He's born. He lives. He dies. Descends into the lower part of the earth. That's the sun going down over the horizon lower part of the earth, and on the third day rises again. See, the devil didn't make that. God did. God created that to show the gospel, right? And it shows the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because he is the son of righteousness, arising with healing in his wings. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. Jesus, on the day of transfiguration, his face shone how? As the sun. When John saw him in Revelation 1, he said his countenance shone as the sun. Okay? So, I mean, it's not worshiping the sun god. It's worshiping God, who is the light of the world. Amen? I love this. But then, the sun doesn't just rise in the east and set in the west and then rise again in the east. It also rises from the south to the north and back down to the south again. Does it every year. So, it rises east to west every day and then south to north to south again every year. And God made it that way to show the death, burial, resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. It's called the um, solstices, and it's based upon the fact that at one part of the year, the sun at high noon is at its highest point right above I always get these two confused. The Tropic of Capricorn, 23 and some change degrees south of the equator. 23. Then, and this is like December 21st. Then it rises, and on the equinox of first day of spring, it's high noon right above the equator. Then, 23 and some change more degrees, rises up to the in June 21st, the Tropic of Cancer, I always get that one confused, 23 and some change above the equator, then back down, fall equinox, right above the equator, high noon, then back down again, December 21st. And it does this 46 plus degrees, 46 degrees, 46, 46 boards with a little extra on the corners of the tabernacle, 46 for the temple because Psalm 19 says that the heavens are a tabernacle for the sun, right? And our body is, yeah, you get it. So all of this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? But remember Satan. I will be like the Most High. So in fact, let's, let's look here at Isaiah 14. Don't you think about this. Isaiah 14, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So think of Lucifer being brought down. Sun goes down in the west. Because he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will be like the most high. And at noon, the sun is at its most high place. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. See, Satan wants to steal away from God. So this is why he's copying, this is why all, all the pagan religions worship the sun and the solstices and the equinoxes, including, guess what? Freemasonry. Here's what Fat Albert Pike said in Morals and Dogma about the solstices. Cancer and Capricorn, the two gates of heaven, are the two pillars of Hercules beyond which the he, the sun, never journeyed. And they still appear in our lodges as the two great columns, Jacob and Boaz. Stop right here. Jacob and Boaz were both 23 cubits tall. 
and also the two parallel lines that bound the circle with a point in the center, emblem of the sun, between the two tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Here's what he's talking about. The two pillars, Jacob and Boaz, one has a globe of the stars, the other has a globe of the earth. They're joined together in the temple. Sons of God, daughters of men. Boom. They shall mingle themselves with the, the stars, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what it's all about, people. And you have the two lines are the two equinoxes and the two solstices, Capricorn and Cancer. And they're represented by, Masonry has the two Johns, the St. John the Apostle and John the Baptist. So why? I ask that same question. Notice how they're, they appear. John the Baptist is this rough human, you know, wearing a camel coat, and he's the macho guy. John, for some reason, always characterizes like a feminine. Do you get that now? The active and the passive, the male and the female, yin and yang, sons of God, Yahweh and Shekinah, sons of God, daughters of men. It's wicked. I know it, but that, see, that's their false gospel. Serpent worship by observing times. Pagans for thousands of years worshiped the sun when they could have been worshiping the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Okay? Think about this. The sun going east to west, south to north to south again. You see what I'm doing? I didn't just make that up. I saw this today. Pastor Cooley shares with me some thoughts he has from the scriptures, and he saw something in Job, so I thought, well, I'm going to go read that. And I read Job 1 and 2, and I never saw that before. You always find something new when you read the Bible. I love it. Remember when Satan shows up to God, where the sons of God are, the angels? And God says, where you been, Satan? Remember what he said? The Lord answered Satan, whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it, up and down to dun, dun, dun. because that symbol, up and down, this and that, that symbol, there is Jesus and another Jesus, and there's all these myths and stories about this other Jesus type figure throughout mythology sort of having some of the characteristics of Jesus which has caused some of the scholars to say well your Jesus is none other than Mithras or Quetzalcoatl or Ophis or Apollo or what mm -mm, don't believe it they were copycats because Quetzalcoatl take a look was number one born of a virgin number two associated with the star Venus a star of the morning, was God of the wind, associated with death by a cross, was devoured by flames and turned to ashes, and was expected to rise from the dead, which is why the Aztecs received Cortez with such great enthusiasm. They thought he was Quetzalcoatl, Viracocha. Okay? And the Mayans, same way with, uh, who was it? Can't remember who was showed up there on their shores, but he was white bearded Spaniard, and they're going, Oh, it's Viracocha. But here's Quetzalcoatl, always seen like being slain and nailed to a cross. The setup. And what is that X thing an image of? Because it all points to the tabernacle, right? Whether the tabernacle of the stars, the heavens, Or this tabernacle. Remember, Paul said, in my flesh, number one, Paul said, I have thorns, literally, a messenger of Satan to buffet me in my flesh. Flesh is made up of DNA. 
And then he said in Romans 7, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. 2 Corinthians, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, the serpent, there it is, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And the setup all of these years and all of these serpent gods has been a setup for people to receive another Jesus. What if these mummies turn out to be true? What if it's been shown, proven then, that something up there mingled itself with human beings and became this hybrid creature? Okay, then everybody's going to resort to all of these pagan myths and say, that must have really happened. And they're going to say, well, the Bible's not true because the Bible is just another one of those myths about the dragons who came down and made it. And I have a feeling that's what they're going to say. Central America, South America, the Americas. The Native Americans, First Nation tribes, still all worshiping serpents. In Central America and in some of the northern native cultures, this is from MessagedEagle.com, an article that they have on early American serpent worship. The rattlesnake was sacred and it frequently appeared in religious architecture. The Cherokee called it the head of the serpent tribe and the Hopi regarded it as the elder brother of their snake clan. So here you see an image of some of these Native Americans, I believe obviously North American tribes, and they worshipped serpents and or dragons of various kinds. Some sort of reptilian god. This, they regarded the serpent as their great brother and one of their gods. You have the serpent mound. In fact, all over America, you have serpent mounds in different places. The most prominent is in Ohio. And come to find out that the serpent mound in Ohio is also aligned with the solstices. The observing of times. Worshipping Venus instead of Jesus. Worshipping the dragon or the serp or the, the serpent of the stars. They didn't call it the Milky Way. They said it to them it looked like a dragon or a serpent in the heavens. And that's what they worship. They worship the stars rather than one who made those stars. So even whether it was like in the pyramids of, you know, the uh, step pyramids, the square pyramids down in Central and South America, or the mounds in North America you still had this feathered, plumed serpent god that they worship. Here is, this was found in Mississippi. It's called the Mississippi Tablet. You can see two entwined feathered serpents in this circular disc. The two entwined serpents represent the two solstices that we talked about which represents the sun rising and setting just a little over 46 degrees from Capricorn to Cancer, Cancer to Capricorn and back again. It represents the sun. And this was how they developed their calendar. They were taught this technology of making a calendar and observing the stars and the motions of the sun and so on. They were taught this from their giant gods who were over them, their serpent gods who were over them. They were taught this. Here's another image of, look at this. The, hand, the eye and the hand, are you kidding me? I mean, that goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, right? But you see the, the feathered headed serpent with the tuft of feathers on his head. This was the basilisk or the cockatrice, the fiery flying serpent, which was known even in the North Americas to the Native American tribes. 
and they inscribed that circular image representing the two solstices and the equinoxes. They were worshipers of time. They followed that. They followed the stories of the dragon gods that their ancestors worshipped. Here, that book I referenced earlier about the guy who's writing about serpent worship all around the world and in the Americas, this was one of the drawings that he included in there. An Indian inhabiting the country, it says, from West Louisiana, 1741. Notice what he's carrying in his hand. A serpent emblazoned with the sun, and he's got it tattooed on his chest too. Or, in other words, a fiery flying serpent. Check this out. Pre-Columbian Hopewell Green Slate Serpent Swastika. Origin, the Mississippi Valley, circa 200 B.C. Because somebody's been noticing that the swastika was not invented by Adolf Hitler. The swastika, it's like one of those, you notice that this one is two serpents. Think about it. The two serpents, like this, like in your DNA. These two, the swastika basically represents opposites. Remember what Satan does? Up and down, to and fro. That's what the swastika represents. And it mentions there in Job, Satan and the sons of God, dragons. But anyway, the serpent, the swastika, here's more representations of different tribes in North America that use the serpent swastika as one of their main symbols, representing the observing of times that you have in the swastika. It's basically a cross, so you have four points. So you have the four cardinal directions, you have the four elements, like what a pyramid represents. Then you have the two equinoxes and the two solstices. The observing of times, basically it's a false gospel. Another Jesus and another gospel because it's based on the number four. Therefore, it represents the fourth kingdom. Then I ran across this. See, I went through, I've been collecting notes on this for years. And to do the research on this, I just went back through my notes. Things that I had forgotten about for years. And I ran across, of all things, a Masonic ritual. A Masonic order. You know, you have the York Rite, the Scottish Rite, you have the Shriner Masons, you have different orders of Freemasonry in different parts of the world, and in Mexico, you have the order of Quetzalcoatl. Masonic order formed in Mexico. The initiates drink a strong drink called Pulk. Basically, it's agave that they turn into a liquor and as part of the initiation process into the order of Quetzalcoatl, you got to get drunk first, okay? And here's what the ritual involves. It is believed that Quetzalcoatl, this is from phoenixmasonry.com, it is believed that Quetzalcoatl was a great Indian king living about the time of Christ. See the connection they make with it? It was he who is credited with having discovered corn, inter introducing it as a good staple food source to the Indian nations. Afterwards, in ancient Mexico, the name Quetzalcoatl was given to any priest who was supposed to have attained enlightenment. That's what Freemasonry is all about. Now you have been chosen to receive this great name as a member of the Order of Quetzalcoatl. Your guide will be Netzahuacoyotl, the famous king of Texcoco, a poet philosopher and leader of men, from your entrance into the abode of the great gods, and they say Freemasonry is not a religion, right? The abode of the great gods until your departure to the dwelling places of men, he will be your faithful guide and mentor. Now remember who Quetzalcoatl was. Quetzalcoatl, the name itself means feathered serpent, fiery flying serpent, the serpent's root. In other words, Quetzalcoatl is, if you haven't figured it out by now, it's the Antichrist. And they're saying the Antichrist in this ritual is going to be your guide. So here's part of the ritual itself. 
Now that thou hast assumed the pledge of fulfillment and will initiate thy pilgrimage to the land of lowly creatures, we charge thee to prepare thyself so that thy mission among men shall bear fruit. Thou wilt receive full consecration in a great temple of Quetzalcoatl, such as the pyramids like Kukulkan, the pyramid of the sun and the moon in Mexico, or Castillo. But before assuming the human form, thou shalt receive purification by the four great elements, fire, water, earth, and wind. These are controlled by the four great Tlalocs. Again, that's from Phoenix Masonry. The Tlalocs were the guardians of the four elements, which Wicca says are four dragons. And they say that Freemasonry is not a religion, but it is. It's a repository of the secret society and the mystery religion of the Antichrist coming to us in the last days. Now, missionaries have gone north and south, east and west to all of the Native American tribes from Canada, the Eskimos, on down to Central and South America. Some have been saved. Not many. And there is right now, as I said before, there is a great revival of worshiping the serpent, the dragon, the Quetzalcoatl, the Kukulkan, the Viracocha, worshiping these serpent gods. That's being revived again. And it's latched on to many of these. I have a friend who spent years among the Ojibwe trying to minister, trying to preach the gospel to them. And they hated him. The tribal elders despised, and this was a good guy. He loved those people. His wife was Ojibwa. That's why he went. And all he ever got was persecution. And he finally just, he had to give up and quit. He just couldn't do it anymore. And I think God ended it. And I think God probably said, I gave you a chance to those people. And I'm going to turn you back over to your old gods and your old ways. Because that's all they really wanted to begin with. But the revival is coming. Not a revival of Christianity, a revival of worshiping the dragon, because that's what says in Revelation chapter 13. They worship the dragon and they worship the beast who gave him that power. So that revival, I think, is well on its way. And what if these mummies turn out to be real? Where's your faith? Where's your trust? I don't even want you to trust me. Trust only the Word of God. And you're going to need that as your shield of faith. They keep saying in these UFO websites, disclosure is coming. You know what that means? They're going to reveal the truth that these alien gods have visited and they're coming again. And a lot of these people now, those who are following the UFO movement, they're saying this is going to be for our betterment. It's the evil government that's trying to keep us from that. And we're, their technology is going to make us go to the stars. That's what Tom DeLong belong, uh, believes. Don't fall for it, people. Set up. You have the real gospel right here. They're going to lie through their teeth about that. And it's going to be so powerful that almost everybody's going to believe it, except very elect. My question to you is, is that you? I hope it is. And I hope, you know, that it doesn't turn out, well, I don't know. I mean, if these mummies end up being a hoax, then I just wasted your time. If they turn out to be real, and I'm, you know, I'm here I'm saying I hope they're real, but then again, what does that mean? I wish that None of this would ever come up now, but it is. What are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the lies of the dragon? Are you going to believe the Word of God? Stick with the Word of God. i got to run. I've been here long enough. I love you. God bless you. You're the reason why I do what I do. So hang in there. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.